Ah, oh, my angel, you were just a toddler when I went away to war. I hardly knew you, but at least we do get to spend eternity together. Papa, these people have come to hear your story. Please, Papa? Because you asked, my sweet. What is there to say about my early life? It was as if I lived my entire life in a single day. Have any of you ever felt that your entire life led up to one single moment? I do recall being told that I was stubborn as a mule, on more than one occasion, in fact. Perhaps this is the point at which I should share some Midwestern folk wisdom with you. The mule, he is a funny sight. He's made of ears and dynamite. His heels is full of bricks and string, tornadoes, battering rams and things. He's fat as any poison pup. Watch just as meanness keeps him up. He's always scheming round to do the things you most don't want him to. The mule, he lives on anything. He's got a lovely voice to sing. And when he turns and leaps at you, why, it sounds like buzzsaws out of tune. Some folks don't treat mules with respect. They say they ain't got no intellect. That may be so, but if you've got to go to heaven on the spot and want a way that doesn't fail, just pull the tassel on his tail. <laughs> the mule, he minds his own biz. He don't look loaded, but he is. It is true that I joined the Union forces immediately after Fort Sumter, and I rose steadily through the ranks, eventually attaining the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And in September of 1862, I was appointed to the rank of full Colonel. Now at this time, I was not able to really relax and enjoy my newfound rank because my men were stationed in <clears throat> Corinth, Mississippi. Now there are a couple of facts about Corinth, Mississippi of which you need to be made aware. The first fact is that Corinth was on the Mississippi River, making it important by water for supply purposes. But there's another fact that I believe is even more important, and that is that Corinth marked the convergence of five, count them, five railroads. That made Corinth absolutely essential from both rail and by water. Now I could read a map as well as any other officer, and I impressed upon my men the importance of Corinth, and I made sure they understood that Corinth was absolutely essential to the rebel war effort. In fact, I submit there was no single rebel location that was more important long range to their war effort, at least in the Western theater. Now, my men leading up to Corinth had been chasing the Confederates. We'd marched them from Corinth 12 miles to Wasento. We'd marched them 10 miles to Uca. We marched them some 12 miles to Coal Creek. We marched them another 12 miles to Cedar Creek. Then we marched 10 miles to Tumbria. Now, Tumbria was a town that was on the Tennessee River. And there my men were asked to stop marching long enough so that they could load the confiscated bales of cotton onto the rail cars to be shipped north for the war effort. Well, now they were rewarded for their efforts there by being told that it was their job to march 34 miles back to <coughs> Corinth, Mississippi. Now while we were marching back, my stubborn mule-like tendencies were never more important or never more relied upon. I can also tell you that as we neared Corinth, we could hear a continuous roll of gunfire. It seemed to be a never-ending roll, and what that told my men was one fact, and that was we were heading into one big battle. In fact, as my men were marching and the gunfire volume increased, we received a hurried orders to rush forward immediately and take the line, and I said, but my men are utterly exhausted from endless marching. If you push them harder now, it'll render them utterly useless. But the firing didn't stop, and neither did my men. In fact, they quickened their pace as they heard the gunfire, and also as they, they took the line and they, they broke into a dead run, they were met with tremendous cheers by the Union soldiers fighting desperately to hang on. My men had never received a warmer welcome, and upon hitting the line, Johnny Reb made their welcome even hotter. Yes, they had gunfire that they had never experienced before of an intensity that we'd never come up against. But we had stopped the retreat of the Union forces, and there seemed to be something of a stalemate. I realized that more was called for, so I shouted to my men, I said, fix bayonets, men, let's charge! And I led a counter charge against the Confederates. And we were having our way, and the Confederates were falling back. And just as the Confederates were falling back, just as the cheers were at their loudest, just as we were changing the nature of the battle, I was shot through the heart. Yes, I died on the battlefield that day. I gave my life for the Union. But I will tell you that my men changed the battle, and I will tell you that... <clears throat> The next day, the Confederates were routed. Corinth was saved.
I do remember his funeral. It was the largest funeral procession in Peoria ever. It was a mile long. There was a marching band. The 103rd Regiment led the way, followed by the National Blues, members of the 47th Cavalry, the Master Masons, and the Knights Templar. His coffin was draped with flags and wreaths, and the ser services had to be held outside because there was such a large crowd. It was like my papa was a king. And then, the strangest thing happened several months later. The sword was delivered by the U.S. Post. It was stolen on the battlefield when my papa was killed. Mama says she thinks a mason found it who recognized the symbols on it and knew where it came from. You see, papa was a mason, and that sword was given to him by the Knights Templar. So Masonic brother found the sword and thought it should be returned to his family. I remember that sword hanging above the fireplace all through my childhood. Well, I want to be here. Thank you for listening.